Hey everyone and welcome back to another video and uh, man, the uh, the top lore reveals in Shadows Rising are so damn cool. I am very happy we've actually gotten through the book and we've got a lot to talk uh, about with you today. We've got a new angle on the events of BFA, we've got new angles in the upcoming events of Shadowlands and very importantly, We've got some real hints about the future of the factions, you know, like the story that's going to be going on outside of the Shadowlands, and seriously, like, Anduin does something pretty damn shocking, and what is even more interesting is that in an interview after the book came out, the author, Madeline Rue, said that uh, the shocking Anduin moment is something that she had to include in the book as a part of her contract with Blizzard. So that lore reveal is something Blizzard really wanted in there, and I think that means we all know it's pretty damn important. Now, of course, nothing beats reading the book yourself. And uh, look, it's a great one and you can get it absolutely free with a free trial of today's sponsor, Audible. The link is down below. Yep, it's free and you can keep it forever, even if you cancel, but you won't want to because Audible is the best place for audiobooks. Like, Later today, I'm hiking Cave Hill near Belfast. What will I be doing? I'll be listening to an audiobook. It's a big part of my life. And seriously, Shadows Rising is super well reviewed. It's got great character moments. It sets up loads of lore. I think you'll love it. So why not check it out, support the channel, and support the author by hitting up our sponsor Audible with that link down below. And with that said, okay, let's get into things. So the fourth war ended at the gates of Orgrimmar and Sylvanas zipped off into the sky to continue her nefarious work. This book is really engaging with the Alliance and the Horde, attempting to rationalize really what's a war that seemed completely pointless, right? Because the war, everyone was motivated, and then the glass shatters when Sylvanas kind of reveals it all and disappears. And everyone's just kind of picking up the pieces and working out what the hell even is Azeroth now that this has happened. So the Horde have learned the lesson of uh, having a singular war chief being a bad idea, and they're attempting to set up a council with every race being represented. However, Talanji, as the Zandalari emissary, she can't really forgive what the Alliance did to her dad, right? They invaded her home, killed her father, in the same way that Taronda can't really forgive what went on at, uh, you know, at Teldrassil. In terms of other things, we've got Gaz who's been made the trade prince of the Bilgewater, then Kalia and Lillian Voss are late to the meeting from the Horde, and they're actually just more interested in the affairs of the undead, which is going to be a developing story as time goes on. But seeing the division and just the potential for division in this new council, Nathanos attempts to assassinate Talanji, causing her to basically give up on the council experiment and leave. And what's important here for the lore reveal is we're later going to see why killing Talanji could have very far-reaching effects for the lore. So, on that, Zekam travels with Talanji. Uh, Bomsambi actually then takes up a personal interest in the two traveling together, and that's something that will be uh, pretty major. But let's hop across the ocean and let's talk about the Stormwind situation, where we've got Taronda and Gen, two longtime allies, of course, basically making it impossible for peace with the Horde to last because they need Sylvanas to be brought to justice. They just won't accept anything until her head is rolled. Well, in response to this, Anduin actually entrusts the whole search for Sylvanas to Turalian and Illyria, and they are told to find her by pretty much any means. So our key takeaways from the setup here, and we'll explore it through this video, is that the Alliance and the Horde are both facing minor internal problems. You've got Talanji being a little bit on the edge of things. You've got, you know, the, the warmongers, the warhawks within the Alliance who just want Sylvanas dead. They're not insurmountable problems, but they're likely tensions that we will see faster while we are away journeying in the Shadowlands. Now, in terms of other key things, we know now that Kalia is not the leader of the Forsaken, but that she has taken an interest in the well-being of all undead. And I think it's also beyond clear now that armistice doesn't necessarily mean peace, right? That it just means the war has stopped for a while because... Really, it seems like there is still an appetite for some war, at least in parts of the Alliance side. Okay, so with much of our establishing done, let's talk about the situation with Sylvanas, Nathanos, and Syra Moonwarden. So, after Sylvanas is defeated, we know that she ends up going to ICC to defeat Bolvar. But we're really still unsure of her um, ambitions, but of course, because of the trailer, we do know the direct result of her duel, which is that she defeats Bolvar. Now, we then see more souls being fed into the Maw, and that as more of that happens, the Jailer becomes more and more powerful. That power is, of course, then imparted to Sylvanas, and that's what gave 
her the ability to defeat Sarfang, then of course also to defeat Bolvar as well. Now there is one final obstacle though, right, for her before the Jailer can fully begin his war, and this is the big reveal. It's Bomb Samdi, and that's why taking up Bomb Samdi is actually Nathanos's job. So Nathanos goes to Nazmir with Syrah, and they strike a deal with the Widow Bite trolls. And the Widow Bites, who are servants of Shadra, they and actually Shadra has got a new model for Shadowlands. So we might see a bit more of her and that tribe, but they basically have got a bone to pick with Talanji, so they sign up. And the key takeaways here, right, are that we know that the more souls go into the mall, the more powerful the jailer is, and the more that happens, the more powerful Sylvanus and her servants, or his servants, get, because, well, he can impart that power onto them. So Team Horde is dealing with its politics, Team Sylvanus is trying to take out Bomb Samdi so that the next chapter can begin, and Team Alliance, Larry and Turalyon, are hunting down Sylvanus. And wow, when we get to Illyria and Turalyon, they really, I mean, Madeline really does just sort of set some future tone. So at the beginning of this book, Anduin, Matthias, and Turalyon are inspecting a corpse in the Stormwind uh, crypts. Now this corpse is from Zandalar, and it seems to have been assassinated by a Dark Ranger. So Anduin proclaims Turalyon as Lord Commander of the Alliance forces. But, it, I mean, it seems solely just for the purpose of bringing Sylvanas to justice, but of course we do sort of know that Anduin is taken out of the picture a little bit, at least at the start of the Shadowlands expansion, so you then have to wonder, Turalyon's just going to be left there to his own devices when we're in Shadowlands, and he will be the Lord Commander. And you might think that would be fine going in with your pre-Shadows Rising knowledge, but after we go through some of this video and you read the book, you're going to see a little bit more how maybe Turalyon's not the man we want in charge. Anyway, Danith Trollbane informs the Alliance that a Dark Ranger was recently spotted traveling with a caravan in the Arathi Highlands. Now, this caravan is led by Apothecary Cotley. And you know what? Cotley's a really interesting guy because he's a bit of a recharacterization for the Forsaken. Like, if you're aware of their lore, the Apothecaries were basically the evil, vile dickheads who were doing experiments and stuff like that. But Cotley is portrayed in this book as being genuinely a pretty nice guy who just cares about the well-being of his fellow travelers. So, our, uh, our alliance team, Larry and Turalyon, they catch up with these refugees, but they find no Dark Ranger. Now, an orc child charges Turalyon and he puts him down gently, but the Void whispers to Ilaria, saying that the child's mother knows something. Turalyon asks her a few questions, but she's stubborn, and, well, deciding that they need the information very quickly, Illyria violently extracts the information from the orc woman's mind. And it's really not shown in, in a way in the book where you're thinking, wow, that was a real good move, Illyria. It's like, oh, really extracting it directly from her mind? You could have done that a bit more peacefully. So that's something, and don't worry, that will develop. Now, Cotley is enraged at Illyria doing this, a clear violation of one of his fellow travelers. And Cotley tells uh, that the Dark Ranger had sworn them all to silence, but directed them to Faldir's Cove. Now, this really, and what we sort of see happen, is kind of the first sign of this husband and wife duo using their respective powers for their own cause's benefit, but perhaps in a way where we might have moral issues with it, right? Like, sort of enhanced interrogation. I know it's a bit odd bringing a, you know, a real world term, but uh, you know what? I think void and light stuff kind of does count as that. So they arrive at the cove and they find a smuggler who also refuses to answer questions. Their course already set, Turalyon shackles the man with the light whilst Illyria brutally tortures him. That's pretty rough. Now, to paint a picture of just how grim of a scene the two of these, uh, these two have actually conjured up, Jaina then arrives while they're torturing the man, and Jaina's outraged at what's going on. But that aside, they do get the information they need. The Dark Ranger has actually sailed to Zandalar, which sets off the next sort of wave of our story. But here's the key takeaway, right? Turalyon is in this position of power as Lord Commander of the Alliance forces, and Illyrian himself, they don't mind just abusing their power against really what you consider like basic dignity of other people to get what they want. It's a way more harsh version of those two characters, but if you think about it, you know, thousand years of war, they've, be they've been through a lot. So perhaps because they've seen all of these cosmos-spanning conflicts, 
they're just going to struggle empathizing with, you know, the person they're dealing with. And maybe that will lead them down a dark path. Then my other key takeaway from this segment was Apothecary Cotley, where he's a legitimately nice guy, and I have to wonder if we'll see more of that balanced Forsaken characterization going forward, because certainly between the previous novel and then this one, we are seeing more sides to the Forsaken than just the, you know, for the Dark Lady, we want to kill everyone kind of group. Okay, speaking of death... Let's talk about Bomb Samdi, of course, a fan favorite from BFA. And, uh, well, the Low of Death is taking a more direct and desperate uh, sort of uh, sort of role in things because, turns out, things are not as good for him as you would have thought. Now, Talanji doesn't like Bomb Samdi one bit, and she obviously feels very trapped by the deal that her father made. So what happens is that Bomb Samdi guides Zekan to becoming the official Horde representative to the Zandalari. Now, one of the ways that he gets Zekan's trust is by showing him a vision of the afterlife, where Sarfang is happy with his family, which honestly is a bit morally dubious from Bum Samdi because, well, Sarfang is almost certainly, of course, in the Maw. Anyway, Zekan is then gravely injured, and when he begins to slip into the Maw, Bum Samdi actually snatches up his soul and resurrects him, keeps care of him. Now, we find out that Bum Samdi actually, this whole time, has been subverting the Jailer by taking in the souls of all trolls who die. Now, unlike the Jailer, who becomes more powerful with the more souls that are under his care, it actually turns out that what Bomb Samdi has been doing, actually saving all of these troll souls, that's been putting him under humongous strain. And that really does show that Bomb Samdi, even though he's a bit of a trickster, can be a bit of a dickhead, he's kind of doing things for a little bit of the greater good. And it's actually revealed that what Bomb Samdi really needs is like a solid anchor point to the material realm so that um, he can basically cope because he is basically massively strained by the breaking of the machinery of death, which is pretty wild. And Talanji is now, of course, that link because of the deal that was struck up with her father. But uh, now the situation is that if Talanji dies, Bomsamdi goes. But if Bomsamdi goes, well, Talanji goes as well. But it is revealed that, well, Bomsamdi actually likes Talanji significantly more than he ever liked Rastakan, which I think makes a good bit of sense. Rastakan was a bit, you know, he was a big man for being aloof and kind of not really taking action when he should, whereas Talanji just seems to be a far more shrewd operator and surely a better ally for Bomsamdi, even if they don't particularly, well, even if she doesn't particularly like him. Now, the key takeaway here is that Bomsamdi's deal with Rastakan was basically a way for Bum Samdi to continue resisting the Jailer. And uh, then, of course, it is necessary for Talanji to still exist and to take that role of her father in the link between the two of them if Bum Samdi is going to be able to continue providing that resistance to the Jailer and, I guess, continue providing his service of saving troll souls from the Maw. Now, if we're to take a bit of a detour, well, Flynn wins a new boat in a game of dice, as I think is normal for him. And, you know, after their great banter with their previous adventure stealing the Abyssal Scepter, Flynn and Matthias Shaw actually end up teaming up uh, once again and going on a voyage. And, well, with the information gathered by Illyria and Turalyon, they set off for Zandalar. And on the long journey, they get drunk, they talk about their pasts, and they kind of realize they actually dig each other quite a bit. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But shortly after they land, Matthias is taken prisoner by the Zandalari, so Flynn rushes to Polaris to seek help. And, uh, well, Matthias has got plenty of time in prison to think about how Flynn smells of whiskey and soap. So, yes, Matthias and Flynn have their friendship somewhat turn into a relationship, but it is nearly all uh, implied. So that's what's going on with those two characters. But next up, we've got a new deal. A new deal, yes. The Blood Trolls. They make their move. Coordinated by Nathanos, who of course is there with his mission to take down Bomsamdi. So, the Blood Trolls. They attack the minor shrines of Bomsamdi using child sacrifice to power them. They then lay siege to Bomsamdi's necropolis, of course, where we leveled. And when all seems lost, the combined forces of the Horde and the Zandalari arrive to push the Blood Trolls back. Yes. Bumsamdi is saved by Talanji, and Syra Moonwarden is captured in the scuffle. Talanji, now aware of the blood troll rebels, the assassination attempts on her and Bumsamdi's true motivations, well, she now commits, recommits, I should say, the Zandalari to the Horde. 
and really with that, Talanji makes a new deal with Bonsamdi so that he can actually be the Low of Kings, but that her line would no longer be directly connected to the Loa. And this basically means that Bomsamdi now has the power he needs to protect the souls of the trolls. And that of course also then means that if one of them dies, the other one will not necessarily always die. So a key takeaway here is that Bomsamdi actually surviving the book is a humongous victory for the good guys. Uh, not only that, but Talanji and the wider horde are in a pretty good position to actually potentially like, you know, survive and actually thrive through the Shadowlands. So that's all pretty big stuff, but well, the final section of the novel is dedicated to showing the dark side of the Alliance, and this is pretty cool. So, Syrah is sent to the Alliance as a peace offering. Initially, she is brought to Stormwind so that Anduin can interrogate her. And it doesn't go so well, and Anduin gets frustrated. He gets so frustrated that a very visible wisp of void magic snakes down his arm. Syra mocks him, asking how it feels to know that he is lost, saying, Take heart, falling lion, you will serve well. This is, of course, in reference to Anduin using the void magic. So, ultimately, you've got to wonder, how does the void tie in here, and why is a servant of the jailer teasing about the void? I mean, certainly a bit of me does think that, like, you've got void magic and you've got maw magic, and they are kind of a similar dark purple color. But here's what matters, this moment of weakness from, uh, from Anduin. That was actually Blizzard who said, you must put this here, to Madeline Rue, the author. She was told specifically in the brief of this book that this moment of Anduin showing void weakness had to be put in. And here's our key takeaway. Anduin is internally conflicted between the light and the void. And you know what? He's always had a bit of this uh, dimension to his character. Yes, he was goody two-shoes a bit, but in Miss of Pandaria, he did mind control people. He did do that. And BFA, he was sort of forced into this sort of good guy, you know, narrative hole. But in this book, we are seeing him become a bit more morally conflicted. I'm not going to say it's future bad guy Anduin, but we've seen Anduin kind of almost use Void, and you know, he was interested in Void Priest or Shadow Priest stuff in the past. And then what have we seen? We've seen uh, Illyrian Turalyon be honestly pretty damn, pretty damn wild, a bit shocking in how they actually used their powers to get information. That is showing a darker side to the Alliance. Anyway, finally, Syrah is sent to Toronto and explains why she followed Sylvanas, that she was risen against her will and that knowing only pain and undeath, with nothing but the maw waiting at the end of the line, she grew to hate everything, and that's why she joined up. And this is reflected in Sylvanas' words at the end of the novel. In an internal monologue, she states, the unjust ladder of their lives must be dismantled, not rung by rung, but all at once. And really, I feel that this is the ultimate ambition of Sylvanas, the Jailer, Syrah, the whole lot of them. That the machinery of death breaking will cascade into a cosmos disrupting or destroying force, such that their states of servitude, being, you know, that to their corpses or to the machinery of death, will end. And that in some way, they will be free from the cosmic order of things. You know what, I think it's interesting. Madeline, I think, was a great uh, choice for what Blizzard wanted to convey in Shadows Rising. It's clear that she was given a very tight brief to work around, but I think, like, her background is in writing fantasy horror novels. I think that probably worked out quite well here. I mean, the assassination scenes were well-paced. The creepiness of Nazmir was also represented really quite nicely in the book as well. And, uh, you know, it just makes me think that this book, beyond just setting up the character ambitions, that it's also setting up some tone for Shadowlands in the future. I mean, Legion was going to be a galactic demon space war, so they went to the galactic demon space war writer, William King. So, I suppose, what does it mean the Blizzard went for a fantasy horror writer? Pretty interesting indeed. Ah, <sighs> so there you go. Massive lore reveals, uh, and of course, there's lots more texture in the book. You know, nothing can beat actually listening to it or reading uh, yourself. So if you want to do that, you want like, what, 10 hours of really high quality entertainment, man, Audible, who has sponsored this video, click that link, start the free trial, and bam, Shadows Rising will be yours uh, to keep forever. And of course, there's a lot more of the Warcraft library and many, many, many other books up there as well, making it overall a pretty damn sweet deal. So thank you to Audible for supporting this channel. Thank you to you for watching this video. And hey, thank you to Madeline for uh, writing a book that's given us a hell of a lot to talk about and that certainly will be food for thought well into the future. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.